Yes, we are live now on our YouTube channel. Good morning, one and all, following on our YouTube channel and science-loving people across the globe. This is Govind Lakotia welcoming all curious minds for this 29th weekend science series of Bajaj Science Education Center, Vardha. I welcome today's resource person, Jim Sibulski from US, who have joined us from California for this talk. Faculties across the country and students from middle school to postgraduate students are excited to listen to the speaker for today's interesting topic of old school. May I now request Dr. Dheeraj Naik, co-host of this event, who is working as assistant professor and coordinator of institutions innovation council at Bajaj College of Science, Vardha. Thank you, Dr. Lakotia. Bajaj Science Center has made painstaking efforts to continue webinar series on various science topics on Sunday and has invited scientists, faculty of various disciplines to deliver talks and had fruitful discussions with students of Vardha. Today, on a such a bright Sunday, in a so, uh, in association with my institution, Innovation Council of Bajaj College of Science and Bajaj Science Center, uh, we have arranged a webinar on a very important groundbreaking uh, innovation in the field of portable microscope. Friends, uh, we have been using light microscope, which are popularly called as compound microscope. We use these compound microscopes so often that it is becoming a basic tool for students of botany as well as uh, other branch of uh, life sciences, without which we are truly helpless when it comes to teach, learn and discuss fundamentals in biological and physical sciences. These compound microscopes cost for 6,000 to 15,000 in Indian rupees. They occupy space in the lab and they require maintenance as well. Now, during this pandemic time, we ended up getting uh, many virtual lab practicals with this microscope and they ended up having, uh, not having, uh, having a very little practical experience uh, by the students to handle this microscope. So there is a serious limitation in the post pandemic time that we are facing right now. And therefore, cold school could be one of the best and low cost, post, uh, low cost portable microscope 
which could be used by our students. We are really excited to hear from Dr. Jim. May I now request Dr. Lakotia to give the brief introduction of our today's guest. Govin, you are mute, you are mute I think. Yeah, sorry. I was saying that uh, Jim doesn't need any introduction and I take the privilege to enlighten his motivating profile to our viewers. Friends, we are very fortunate to have such an eminent inventor who has made the world think about going Google in science and technology. We'll be talking about this product today. Jim is co-inventor of the Spole Scope and has spent the last six years developing and field testing pole scopes over the world. As a PhD student in Prakash Lab at Stanford University, Jim has worked under the guidance of Professor Manu Prakash, who is the alumni of IIT. Now he's at Stanford University. Jim is now working as president and CEO of the Spolescope Instruments. His primary role is to lead efforts to provide access to scientific tools across the globe. This is all about Jim. And after his talk, you will come to know more about him. So with great honor and pride, I request Jim to start it. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you so much for having me uh, here today. Um, I um, had the uh, fortune of uh, working with uh, uh, Professor Manu Prakash for, uh, for some years while I was at uh, Stanford University. And um, so I had um, some, some good guidance to get started on um, you know, um, thinking about frugal innovations and, and their uh, potential impact in uh, places like uh, India and all over the world. And um, so, yeah, it's really, it's really a pleasure to uh, share all my uh, experiences related to Foldscope with you today. Um, so my, uh, my journey with uh, Foldscope um, started uh, in 2012 uh, when I uh, started working with Manu Prakash at Stanford University. And at that time, uh, we really wanted to come up with a, with a uh, device which would you know, have a global impact and would allow us uh, to um, achieve you know, microscopy at a cost of $1 per unit. And um, so uh, during my PhD work there, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about uh, solutions for that as well as to other uh, uh, frugal innovations. And um, I traveled uh, around the world quite a bit, uh, exploring um, applications of the fold scope and you know, uh, the success of our, our different innovations. And um, so I'll just share uh, some of those, um, some of the outcomes of all that work with you today. Uh, it's just a brief uh, intro. Um, so our, our company right now is uh, called Fold Scope Instruments. Um, and we're based out of, um, California and, um, you know, uh, in the San Francisco area here in Northern California, uh, we have just a small team. And um, so I want to start out just by talking about uh, what it is um, that drives us as a team and what, it, what our goals are in, in the products that we're um, um, let's see here. There we go. Sorry, my computer is slow. Uh, I think I want two slides. Um, so our vision and value proposition here. Um, so our our, um, our real uh, value proposition is um, to uh, magnify curiosity worldwide. We're really concerned about you know um, seeing that everyone gets a good um, uh, science education and they have uh, tools for hands-on um, opportunities. And so um, we really want to make um, those tools and uh, just science in general accessible to everyone. Um, and uh, to do so, 
we've tried to take an instrument that, you know, um, as, as was uh, stated in the uh, in introduction there, uh, tends to be, um, you know, expensive, uh, especially for individuals, and reduce it by uh, more than 100 times in terms of the uh, cost of the um, actual parts. Um, our current microscope, it's uh, based out of uh, paper, although it has a glass ball lens. Uh, we sell it for $1.75 per unit. Um, in the future, you know, there's, uh, we're going to have some um, revisions of our innovation that are going to sell for less than that, about $1 per unit in volume. And um, it's going to use the same lens that we use now. And using that lens, you can see um, single cell bacteria and all sorts of microorganisms uh, of course, uh, different uh, crystalline structures um, to look at, you know, chemistry of things and, and um, just for a wide variety of applications. So until now, one thing that's been important uh, for our company is just really to uh, develop um, not only an instrument, but a community to support the users of our instruments. And so uh, right now we have a community um, based on over a million fold scopes. It's actually closer to 1.5 million fold scopes in 158 countries. Um, we, um, we have the largest, you know, given that we have the largest uh, microscopy uh, community uh, in the world, uh, mostly of amateur microscopists. And um, in building that community, we we're really, um, as, as I mentioned, we're trying to magnify curiosity worldwide. And we're really doing that uh, one user at a time but also in, in a way where people can learn from each other. I think uh, mentorship is, is just a huge part of our goal and um, you know, our, our mission. And uh, the tools that we provide are uh, giving capability for really research quality um, images. And I'll have um, a video that'll uh, show this uh, clearly later and also a bunch of photos um, that uh, will help you uh, <laughs> um, test my uh, statement there. Um, so just as a quick overview, um, I wanted to say a few more words about the, the problem that we're trying to solve. So you might, um, you might question, you know, uh, do we really need a microscope um, so inexpensive? Uh, what, what is it? How do we see this problem that we're solving? Uh, and then some more details about our solution, that is the fold scope, as well as um, other innovations that we're looking to, um, to bring uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. Um, and then, um, you know, a low cost microscope, um, you know, it does cost money to make it and to sell it at such a low price, you might wonder how does that work from a business perspective? So I thought I'd say a few words about uh, revenue model um, and then a little bit about our history, um, you know, traction and validation of uh, some of the work we've, we've done in the past. Um, some of the timeline uh, that got us where we are as well as where we're going. And then just a few words about future plans. And I wanted to leave some time um, at the end then for questions, because I, I hope there's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> keep, uh, keep your questions in mind and we'll, we'll address them at the end. Um, so um, the problem as we see it is that current technology uh, really leaves uh, significant unmet needs for STEM learning uh, as well as for exploration. Um, and you know this is, uh, pertinent both for uh, science education as well as for science research. Um, so uh, if we just think about, you know, conventional uh, methods of uh, teaching microscopy in, in schools now, there's uh, usually a single microscope in a classroom. And, um, you know, I mean, at least uh, when I was in school, I guess I, uh, I haven't, uh, haven't been in school for a while, but um, my understanding is, um, you know, it still works the same way that uh, you, you go to the, um, you know, you, you wait for use of the microscope. And then when it's your turn, you can use it a short amount of time. And then you need to um, return to your seats. And that's, you know, you don't get a lot of um, experience using microscopes in, um, in the, um, you know, sort of K through 12 uh, grade levels. And I think um, that's really been, um, the case for, for quite a number of years. And we, we really think that innovation can help to expand the opportunities in that domain so that people can explore outside the classroom. Everyone can have, you know, a more extended experience in using um, microscopy tools and in just uh, doing their own explorations. Um, 
And um, yeah, so that's how Foldscope is helping as well as, uh, as I mentioned, some future innovations that I'll talk about later. Um, remote education is uh, sort of a new uh, concern, um, I think, especially in the COVID-19 area and uh, just with, um, you know, other uh, various situations in the U.S. I know, um, you know, homeschooling is becoming more prevalent. Um, and um, just different uh, remote education opportunities allows, you know, people who have the expertise and how to use a tool to really give, um, uh, you know, students an opportunity to learn about that. Um, and I think having low cost tools makes it possible to still incorporate hands on activities, even in those remote learning situations. Um, and then finally, uh, my third category there, curiosity and investigation. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in science that uh, go unexplored, unexploited or unexplored uh, just because, you know, there's really a need for having robust tools in the field. And in many cases, those tools are not readily available or, um, you know, they're too expensive. Um, in some cases, it's just, uh, you know, it doesn't work well in that particular environment. And so uh, one thing that's, um, that we saw as a huge opportunity for, for our tool is just to enable people to um, investigate, you know, various, um, various things in the field. And what I'm showing here is um, uh, in the picture is actually some beekeepers. And uh, there's been a tremendous number of beekeepers that have uh, contacted us over the years with an interest in having uh, tools for microscopy so that they could diagnose, um, you know, issues uh, that their, um, their beehive may, you know, their, um, their bees may be having at a particular time. So there might be, um, you know, fungal, they can get fungal infections, they can get parasites, they can get uh, different types of, um, you know, bacteria that can cause um, some of the hive, hive to die. And it's difficult to know how to treat that without having microscopy tools available. That's just one uh, example of uh, many that we've received um, from our community. Um, so our solution again uh, is the Foldscope. Um, you see the one that I'm showing here is our, uh, the one that we are currently uh, manufacturing and, um, and selling. And <clears throat> it's made from a uh, durable um, waterproof paper um, that uh, allows you to actually take the fold scope. You could stick it in a bucket of water for three days, uh, pull it out, just shake it off, and um, you would be able to use it um, at that moment. So, so the tool is uh, extremely uh, durable in that regard. It's waterproof. Um, the uh, lens that we're using is a, it's a single uh, borosilicate glass bead. And when they're produced in, uh, in parallel, you can make them 50,000 pieces at a time. And that allows us to purchase them for, you know, extremely low um, cost per unit um, while still having very high precision. And uh, in fact, allowing us to achieve two micron resolution. And with that resolution, as I mentioned earlier, we can see single cell bacteria and a variety of uh, microorganisms. The magnification also is a 140x uh, magnification uh, with our current fold scope. And in future uh, generations, we'll have other magnifications as well um, as part of the standard um, device. Um, the actual materials cost less than $1 in parts. Um, of course, there's um, other costs that are incurred, such as labor fees and shipping and packaging. And so uh, that's what uh, leads us to a slightly higher cost per unit. Um, and in some cases, we provide various accessories as well. Um, the, um, every fold scope that we sell is uh, compatible with a cell phone, which means that you can um, essentially take your cell phone. We have a magnetic coupler that you can uh, attach to your cell phone using uh, adhesive tape. And when you bring your cell phone up to the fold scope, you can essentially um, use your cell phone to, cap to capture images uh, from the fold scope. And we also have an app which um, includes uh, various features such as um, a, a scale bar, uh, image recognition tools, 
um, and a variety of other things that we're, um, we're adding over time. It's just in the early stages. Um, and then there's actually a third method of viewing. So uh, I think I mentioned two so far. You can see the uh, eye viewing method where you just look directly into the fold scope. I just mentioned the cell phone viewing. There's actually a third method where you can use a light source such as the flashlight on your cell phone. Um, you take the same magnetic coupler and you flip it over. So it's the reverse polarity. You attach your, um, the light source to the back of the fold scope and you can project an image of the sample onto the wall. And uh, that's actually really useful for showing um, in, you know, microscopic images to an audience. So everyone can, can see, um, see the image at the same time. Um, see, I just realized I haven't, I'm not able to see if there's any questions coming in. I'll just take questions at the end. I'm not, not able to see the chat window right now. In case I, I heard a beep, there might be some questions coming in. Um, all right, I'll just keep going. We'll so, take the um, questions at the end only. We'll collect yeah. the questions and we'll take those questions at the end. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, appreciate that. Um, and um, so next, I just, uh, regarding our current solution, um, I wanted to show some images and a video which helps to demonstrate the quality that we've achieved uh, with this low cost tool and uh, just the pot potential range of applications that it has. Uh, so you see a matrix of images here. Um, you know, there's a, a range of different, um, different specimens that I tried to include here. Um, you can see in the top left, this is actually a tomato skin. You can see um, very uh, clearly different layers and in the, in the different in the sort of uh, cell, cellular structure uh, that it has there. Uh, there's mosquito eggs, the next one uh, down. Um, and you can see the scales on a butterfly wing in the bottom left. Um, uh, in the next row, there's recrystallized citric acid. Um, so you can see some very interesting effects using polarization uh, by adding different filters into your fold scope. Um, you can look at um, either you know, uh, parallel or cross polarization uh, by arranging the filters in different ways. And this one was done using cross polarization, just showing the different um, uh, features of the uh, crystallized uh, citric acid. Um, I won't go through all of them here. I just uh, wanted to touch on a few. Uh, so there's, yeah, you can see um, some algae, uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, I see some other um, cells there. I wanted to also just uh, mention the pollen um, on the right. There's uh, just a huge diversity of pollen out there. And we, a lot of people in our community have made an effort to characterize, you know, one-to-one uh, -one pollen with different types of uh, plants and trees. And I think that that can be a very interesting citizen science project um, that's, you know, where we could distribute fold scopes and just try to um, understand what's um, causing allergies for people, for example, by, um, by looking at uh, pollens that are prevalent in that area and, uh, you know, perhaps providing some, um, some ways of um, helping the people deal with their allergies more effectively. Um, so I'm gonna start a video here that's going to just show you some, what you can see in a fold scope. Can you hear the sound? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. 
right? Yes. Um, hopefully that came through okay. Um, my uh, computer's a little slow, so the video might have been choppy, but hopefully the quality, image quality was okay. Yeah, it was okay. Great, thank you. Waiting for the next slide to load. Okay, good, good. My, sorry, my computer's slow. It takes a few moments to change slides. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, uh, just um, a, a few more words just about our solution. Um, we um, are uh, really focused on making products, making physical products, but I think that that's not enough uh, just to have the physical products and uh, distribute it. Um, I um, mentioned before about, you know, uh, creating community, uh, but also, um, you know, it's important to us to, uh, that we have uh, tools that essentially are going to help, you know, everyone have uh, the expertise of, um, you know, really a, um, an expert um, microscopist or, uh, you know, an, an expert in the field that they're, that they're trying to explore with a microscope. Um, so let me just go through these one by one, but, but I think each, each one of these areas has its own importance and we've, we really try to achieve each one of them as a company. Um, so with our, uh, with the kits that we have right now, um, you know, we're providing a microscope, but we also have, um, various elements that we add to the kits. And, um, you know, for example, we have, um, a, a field guide card that helps you to identify what you're looking at. Um, you know, various uh, different types of uh, sample mounting um, devices. We have ring stickers, um, you know, clear stickers. We have uh, paper slides as well as glass slides um, and uh, just a variety of tools. And um, each fold scope itself comes with a unique ID code that allows you to um, register it on our website and uh, join our broader community. So I think that's, um, we're, I, our goal is uh, that everyone who has a fold scope should feel, you know, that that is um, a device which is uh, which is theirs, which is you know owned by them and uh, created, you know, really put together by them uh, since they have to assemble it, and uh, they they really know how to use it. And but they also belong to a community where they can get help with uh, using the tool itself. Um, and. Um, you know, sort of the missing link in all of that is you may not have the expertise to um, always interpret what it is you're seeing. So sometimes you might be looking at, you know, pond water sample, you see things swimming around, but you're not sure what they are. Um, you know, similarly, as I mentioned earlier with pollen, you might not know what the pollen is from and so forth. And so um, our goal is to, um, over time, to build a, um, a database which grows larger and larger and um, essentially will allow people um, to, um, you know, when they capture an image of a specimen and they, um, you know, they, they do that using our, um, our app, then you can apply machine learning um, algorithms to that to determine uh, what it is um, according to, um, you know, history of pictures that people have taken before them. And so that's, um, you know, I we, uh, use the term, you know, you're, Sort of putting the the skills of world experts in the palm of your hand in that in that case, and that's really our goal. Um, and then um, I mentioned on the third block here a global networking program, where uh, it's not only about um, creating you know this um, uh, a network where you can share the images you found and and your findings, but um, the goal here is really to um, allow uh, people to. Um, to partner, um, well, I guess Foldscope Instruments would be partnering with organizations that would, um, from that, we would have Foldscopes that we're providing to the community and the entire community would share their data so that we can essentially tackle uh, really big and challenging problems that would be um, really too much to solve, you know, for any one person to solve or even for, a, um, you know, a small group to solve. And I think this really gives us the opportunity to use a platform like Foldscope to uh, make a, a very significant contribution to science. Um, you can imagine the, the data that you can collect from millions uh, of users, each of, each of which has their own microscope, um, can, 
can be a, a very huge data set compared to even anything that exists um, currently. And, um, you know, so we um, are hoping to address different issues like air pollution, water pollution, um, lots of things like this, just by having these, um, you know, well-defined citizen science projects and um, a huge community of users that can support us. Um, and so I mentioned earlier, um, just in terms of uh, having a company that can uh, continue to make fold scopes and yet provide them at you know uh, the lowest costs that uh, we can, um, it's it's a little bit um, tricky. And um, so I wanted to say a few words about what is our uh, revenue model. Um, so basically, we've uh, divided our products uh, conceptually into three categories. The uh, I'll start at the bottom left, the low margin uh, kits, the, um, we call them basic classroom kits. Those are the ones that are really, you know, at the low end of, um, uh, of the pricing spectrum. And uh, we, we really provide these at cost. So we're not um, so much, you know, um, making profit off of these. It's not even really contributing to our self-sustainability but it's more contributing to our mission and enabling our community to do the most work that they can with our tools. Um, we also have you know, accessories and, and um, you know, um, accessories that are coupled with, with our uh, basic pouches into large classroom kits. Um, and those uh, are enabling you know, uh, groups to do very large scale workshops um, and um, just really fosters this, this notion of um, you know, very large, large scale uh, interactions between uh, you know, different users within the same um, geographic community. And then we have uh, as well, high margin products um, that include accessories and they have very, uh, very nice packaging to them that essentially allows us to sell and you know to hobbyists um, and to um, essentially make our company self-sustainable while the other products are really at lower margins and um, and support our mission um, i wanted to say uh, also a few words about um, our microscopy community and how is that has really demonstrated a lot of our ability to have traction in the community and, um, and have, have an impact that uh, is, is very broad, but also uh, impacts people, you know, very personally um, and meaningfully. Um, so our, our microscopy community right now is um, over a million users in over uh, 158 countries. And the website that we have um, allows people to post their findings and share it with, with everyone, including us. And it's really uh, teaches us a lot about what our tools are, are good for and some applications that we would not have really thought of ourselves. And so while on one hand, we're making tools and uh, sharing them with the world, um, you know, so we have a, a, a factory for making instruments, we, we think of the microcosmos uh, community as being an idea factory. Um, it's, it's really a place where people can, you know, come up with um, applications and share them. And we have, have just learned uh, so many opportunities for our tools here that uh, it's given us inspiration for making other tools that, that we hope to uh, launch within the years to come. Um, just a few of the different categories um, where you can find, you know, topics um, on our uh, community website. It includes within the education domain, uh, just various uh, exploration, including, you know, uh, in, in different countries around the world, looking at biodiversity, uh, even in some cases, looking at different diseases, um, agriculture, um, applications for, you know, invasive species, as well as uh, different type of pests on crops. Um, I mentioned biodiversity already, just looking at, uh, you know, for different uh, types of species in areas where you might not have found them before, or even entirely new species. Um, health applications, uh, where you can look for indicators of disease, 
or you know, pests that can cause disease. Um, also applications within chemistry and uh, even physical, different physical sciences, uh, you know, crystallization, um, just by taking um, you know, either salt, uh, different types of salts, or um, um, yeah, uh, just sedimenting out, uh, looking at the sediments from, um, you know, maybe you can do centrifugation and look at the sediments from that um, on a glass slide. And you can really learn a lot from, um, from a specimen uh, using those techniques uh, with microscopy. Uh, sanitation, just uh, trying to determine if a water supply is drinkable. I think that's just uh, very huge in, in many areas. Um, the water quality um, in terms of the life that lives uh, in a stream or in a pond. Um, some people have used it for art applications, just uh, looking at different specimens and either you know, using our projection method or drawing what they see. You can do a lot with uh, looking at um, microscopic um, specimens and uh, lots of others. I, I showed just a few examples here at the bottom. Uh, one that I'll mention in the bottom right is um, in um, Africa, there's some countries where the prevalence of fake drugs can, in, in pharmacies and in legitimate pharmacies can be as high as 60%, meaning more than half. And so um, having a tool that will allow you to evaluate the medication to see if it is actually the medication that it should be would be, would be huge. But the problem is, you know, making a tool that's cost effective and generic for a lot of different medications is very difficult. So I think the fold scope, um, this person was exploring the opportunity for using fold scope for that application. And uh, they, with some success, they, they were able to identify a fake drug versus a real one by looking at the microstructure. And um, so this, we haven't explored that further yet, but I think this is one that's one example that I'm really excited about for future uh, explorations. Um, I, <clears throat> I think I mentioned earlier um, that I've uh, traveled uh, quite a bit with uh, full, you know, for doing full scope workshops uh, as part of my uh, PhD work. And um, that's included uh, quite a bit of uh, travel uh, within India. Um, this is, um, you see uh, photos here from some, some of those different trips, as well as uh, some other photos that have just been shared with us. Um, we have also a number of super users in, full, in within the company that, um, um, I mean, super users from India that, that contribute to our company. And um, they, you know, we receive pictures from them all the time as well uh, with the different workshops they do. But the, um, the um, within this slide, I, want, I really wanted to uh, emphasize that we have executed the citizen science program uh, from uh, 2017 that uh, included, uh, you know, as you can see, a very large number of uh, workshops and students and trainers. Uh, I myself, um, uh, you know, participated in the training that we gave in Delhi uh, with over 450 groups there. And um, that was just um, a fantastic, amazing experience to, um, you know, share uh, some, some of my experiences with them and to kind of uh, get them started with their um, sort of uh, their own experiences for, with Foldscope, uh, right? Um, I think they were all had uh, very particular projects they wanted to work on, um, a lot of them in the education domain, some in agriculture, and uh, it's just, um, just a lot of fantastic outcomes from those. Um, from that work. Um, um, so lastly here, I wanted to just say a few words about our timeline and some of the, um, some of the things that we have planned for, for the future. So we started the company in 2012. Um, and so it's only been uh, nine years until now, but uh, we've distributed, um, here, and I haven't updated this, but this should be one and a half million fold scopes um, up until, um, um, the present year, and <clears throat> you know, the company right now is um, just on the verge of uh, uh, executing a fundraising round and um, you know, expanding the team and the product line. And so, I think we have a lot of um, you know, exciting um, things to come in the future as well. Uh, you know, innovations beyond Foldscope. 
And um, I don't have those <laughs> currently uh, patented or uh, protected, so I can't speak uh, about them in a very specific way, but I had just a very brief um, set of bullet points here, and I was going to say a few words uh, beyond that, uh, just to um, talk about our future plans. So uh, currently, you know, our, uh, we have the one version of Foldscope, but we plan to um, actually um, come up with two different uh, versions, um, or we've already uh, designed them, but just to manufacture two versions of Foldscope, one which would be a simplified version, another one which is uh, similar to the current, but it has uh, various features like multiple magnifications. Um, so that's one thing that we're hoping to launch within a few months. Uh, we want to, uh, in addition, uh, add a variety of other new products uh, to our product line. We have about six new products we're working on now. Some of them are also in the domain of microscopy. Uh, some of them are um, different types of games that you can uh, play for learning uh, science. Um, some of them are related to programming, uh, but a variety of different products like that. Um, we also have uh, plans using some of those new innovations, but also, um, also just Foldscope itself. We wanna have a variety of citizen science initiatives um, and um, one of my slides before sort of mentioned that concept where it involves, um, you know, a sponsor as well as different, um, you know, participants and just, um, you know, a very, um, um, a very broad, uh, you know, an important scientific question that we're trying to answer, but just really attacking that from um, the standpoint of, you know, let's, let's just collect a lot of uh, data points and see, you know, see what we learn from those data points and try and try to provide a very broad, a very specific answer to a very broad question. Um, <clears throat> uh, we'd like to add um, more manuf manufacturing centers in other countries. And I think this is really crucial because we've learned that shipping costs are uh, one of the things that really set us back uh, in terms of being able to provide low cost instruments to people around the world. And so if we can develop, um, you know, India is actually the very next place that we hope to set up manufacturing. And so I think that is going to be a huge, uh, have a huge impact on our ability to, you know, provide um, uh, low cost solutions for, um, for, you know, uh, people, for educators in India, as well as, you know, uh, citizen scientists there. Um, and, um, you know, also in South America, we have different uh, contacts where we hope to set up manufacturing and in other parts of Asia as well. Um, finally, uh, we want to expand our uh, global network of super users. And um, so we already have a website, uh, microcosmos.foldscope.com, um, where, you know, we collect various, um, you know, inputs from people and including, you know, the protocols that they used for, for doing their work, uh, pictures, um, you know, all sorts of feedback on, on how to use the device uh, effectively in different contexts. Um, but we also want to um, start providing a um, repository for people to, who make lesson plans to add the lesson plans there. And we want to develop more lesson plans for ourselves and just, um, as I say, um, you know, have a variety of uh, super users um, that can help to support people in different regions. So this is um, just another dimension of our sort of long-term plans. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, that's, um, that's really the uh, bulk of the presentation that I have here, um, but I wanted to leave some time for questions. So, um, so yeah, um, if, if anyone has uh, some questions, I'll, I'll take those now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, uh, for an excellent talk. And it was a very informative one. And there are, there are a lot of students who are uh, listening to you, who have a background of their school going uh, kids. Uh, there are some students who are from undergraduate background, some are postgraduate background. Uh, I'll start with uh, a few questions which I have. Uh, you know, uh, do you, uh, I mean, this Polsco, uh, I'm sure they must be uh, utilized by uh, it remote places as well. Because, you know, in the remote places, uh, there are lots of, you know, you, there is no availability of doctors or pathology labs. 
for example, in urban society or in, in, in any city, you have so many pathology labs, so any patient can go and, you know, uh, you know di diagnose it. But have you had any uh, experience or any, uh, you know, feedbacks from the so such a large community that uh, this pole scope has been utilized in remote re region of the world? Um, yes, I mean, um, this, this was actually um, our very first target application was to do uh, malaria di diagnostics oh, oh. and largely in the remote areas. Okay. And so um, we visited a lot of areas, you know, with that intent. And I think, um, you know, as a company right now, we don't, um, we don't explicitly, you know, sell the full scope with the, um, you know, we, we, we can't advertise that it's usable for medical diagnostics, right? It hasn't, it doesn't have that uh, qualification. But um, I know some people have researched it for that. Um, and, you know, um, I, I myself, as part of my uh, PhD work, I have tested it, you know, for diagnosis of schistosomiasis, various soil transmitted helminths. Uh, we, we did look at malaria. Uh, malaria, you know, um, usually people want to be able to do speciation. And the, um, uh, to do that, we, you do need a resolution that's finer than what we can currently achieve uh, in the fold scope. So um, you can see the parasite, but you can't do speciation there. Oh. Uh, for, for malaria specifically. Um, but, you know, perhaps using fluorescence, that might be a future uh, solution for that. But, um, but yeah, I, we've used it in small scales uh, until now for that, for those applications, but not, not in a large scale yet. Okay, th there is a question in the chat box. Uh, uh, so how many lens have you used for this whole scope? Uh, so there are some technical questions here. Uh, uh, how many lens did you say? I, I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. How many lens? Oh, oh okay, yeah. If you can elaborate this, if you can tell us more about the different components. Oh, have? sure, yeah. Um, yes, let me grab mine here. It's on the, just give me one second. Apologize for that. I had it in my backpack. Um, yeah. So the different components. Yes. Um, so essentially, um, you know, this is this is what it looks like, and um, you know, the lens is actually. Let me try to bring it closer. Uh, is the part in the middle there? You can see it's mostly obscured by a black piece of plastic, which serves as the aperture. But the glass ball is uh, inserted into the, you know, plastic there, and. Um, and that is what really does all the um, all of the magnification. So maybe maybe I'll just go over the details of the fold scope first, as as you mentioned, and then I'll go into the details of the lens. How about that? Um, so the um, the way that it works, you know, you can do panning uh, in uh, two dimensions. Um, it has um, you know a mechanical design that separates out the X panning from the Y pan Y panning, so that in in that way you can. Um, you know, if you're just trying to move in one dimension, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then this, um, this slider in the middle is essentially your Z translation or your focusing. And you might be able to see on one side it's thicker and the other side it's thinner. So as I slide from one side to the other, I'm moving the lens up and down relative to the sample. Um, so, so if I'm using the device, then I'm just, you know, holding it like this, I'm, I have to point it at a light source and then I'm panning and uh, focusing using my fingers. Uh, the sample itself is inserted from the back. So it's just inserted into these, um, might be hard for me to show right now, but there's a flap with a white arrow there. So I insert it into that slit from, the, from one side. And then there's another uh, white arrow there. I insert it into that slit from the other side and I put the flap down and that holds it in place nicely. Um, and that's, that's how I insert my sample. And I want to insert it in such a way so that the, the uh, sample is closer to the lens. So that's very important. Um, yes, sorry, I, um, I probably should have done that uh, earlier in the presentation there. 
but that's how you use the fold scope. And then I think you guys are asking about uh, the lenses. So the, uh, the current lens, um, you know, it's a, a single glass ball. And so uh, usually, um, you know, in uh, conventional microscopes, you're going to have a compound lens. So you'll have a series of lenses that have uh, different, you know, uh, radii of curvature and um, some of them may be aspheric. Uh, some of them may just be uh, spherical. And uh, so of course this one is just purely spherical. It's just, uh, it's just, it's, it's exactly a sphere. There's no, um, it's not just that it's a, sphere, a spherical surface, but it's, a, it's an entire perfect sphere. And so we embed that in a uh, plastic aperture um, using, uh, it's actually the aperture that we're using is formed from a carrier tape. I don't know if you guys are familiar with carrier tape but that's used in the electronics uh, packaging industry for you know, uh, carrying different um, LEDs and surface mount components. But we developed a custom uh, process or a custom design for a carrier, um, a carrier tape that essentially serves as the mounting element for that lens. Um, and then you can see the thing that looks like a washer on there is the, um, it's actually a magnet. It's a uh, ring magnet that when you bring up, when you bring your phone up to it, if you have a, another one taped fast to your phone, you just bring them um, to each other and it's just gonna clip fast like that. So it just it clips right on and align, automatically aligns. Um, and I think you, um, the other question was about magnifications. Um, so we've done um, a wide range of magnifications all the way from um, over 2000 X uh, down to you know, on the order of uh, 50x or a little less. <coughs> and um, the very high magnifications have the disadvantage that they have a very, very short back focal length. So you almost have to be touching the sample in order to view it. And so that, um, for example, even if you're trying to see through a cover slip that has, you know, maybe uh, around 0.2 uh, millimeters or even less thickness, then the, the back focal length is too short and you won't be able to see all the way through the cover slip. Um, so we, we did use them successfully, but we didn't commercialize them for that reason. They're hard to use. And so the one that we have here is the one we sort of like the best, 140X. And uh, in the future, we'll also have, you know, one that's higher and one that's lower, uh, sort of three different magnifications there. Um, all right, so maybe I'll let you. What are um, the different accessories? What's that? What are the different accessories? Oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, let's see. I have our sort of new kit. I don't have the old one here to demo, but um, yeah, the, the accessories that we have, you know, it's uh, just some basic things um, included. Um, so, it's like um, a, a dropper or pipettes, uh, tweezers, and then we have a cotton swab, which is used to uh, clean the lens. Um, and then beyond that, we also have, um, let's see, some sample tubes. We have um, a roll of tape that you can use to uh, mount samples. We include paper slides um, that you can use for, for when you put the tape on it, you can mount the slide, the sample on the paper slide. Uh, we have different types of filters and strainers. Um, the filters go down to five micron size, and then we have 25 micron, I think, and then 100, um, 100 micron, I believe, size. So uh, several different size filters. Um, we have also PVC um, calibration slides. So we have like a, a 0.5 millimeter grid printed on a PVC slide, and then you can put that on, on top of your sample, and it'll essentially give you a length scale that helps you to read how big different things are. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I, also some stickers for mounting different, different types of samples like ring stickers, as well as um, um, other stickers. And then a Petri dish, I almost forgot, Petri dish and a well plate. But yeah, range of, a range of different um, uh, accessories there. How good are these lenses? 
Um, how good are the lenses? Yeah, I mean, um, so the, you know, one, you can think about it in terms of um, uh, resolution. Um, so we can, we've, we took a lot of effort to try to measure the smallest thing that we can see with the lenses. And uh, theoretically, uh, it came to, you know, our calculation predicted it should be right around, you know, 1.8 uh, to 1.9 micron resolution. And experimentally, it comes out to two micron resolution, just a little bit larger. So that's, it's very good agreement between the two. Um, and so, you know, if you take a conventional microscope, um, depending on the magnification, the very best optical microscopes that cost tens of thousands of dollars, you might see things uh, even smaller than half a micron, right? Down to maybe 0.2 uh, micron resolution. But um, you know, with a conventional microscope, it's it's pretty it's pretty close to what you're normally going to be able to resolve. So yeah, it's it's pretty comparable, in my opinion. One more question. So when we are preparing a slide, uh, 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 say a microscope, a glass slide for observing mm -hmm. a local specimen, uh, yeah, you to cover it with the cover slip. Another mm -hmm. clean glass glass light, and then we can see it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, um, if you are, if uh, if it's a wet specimen, uh, then you really want to have um, a cover slip on top, you know, because our lens is getting very close to the sample, okay. and so the lens is going to get wet most likely. But if it's not a wet specimen, um, then it doesn't necessarily have to have a cover slip on top. Um, you know, so um, a very common, when we do workshops in different places, a very common thing is if there's a dog <laughs> at the school, then the students will go to find a tick on the dog and they'll mm -hmm. put it on their slide and we'll look at the tick and we can see the heartbeats and everything and the blood <laughs> and um, that, that it's eating. And, yeah. but uh, we don't put any cover slip. We're just looking at oh, it directly. Okay. So it's not needed, but it's for, for, for wet samples, I would say it's needed, but otherwise oh, not. Oh, great, great. Okay, there is a one more question. Uh, can you elaborate the application of core scope in physical science, like in physics, how, uh, I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think that's a great question. Um, so I think, um, you know, normally the, the ways that we've used it in the past um, have been uh, related to um, looking at, um, you know, like salts, like precipitates and uh, salts and things like that. So that's maybe a little bit closer to, um, to chemistry, but I mean, um, within, within physics, you know, I mean, there's also, there's physical chemistry. I guess when I made the yes. comment earlier about physics, that's kind of what I was thinking is like the physics of the of the, um, you know, uh, different solids and things like that. And um, I think there's a lot that you can do using centrifugation in the field of physics. And so yeah. um, just learning about, yeah, like, um, you know, like in geology and in different fields like that, just taking the, the samples that you have, trying to separate out the parts that you're interested in and then looking at it through a microscope. Yeah. yeah. I remember in fact, uh, uh, from Dr. Manu Prakash's lab, there was in fact some kind of thread-like structure where you can centrifuge a, a small, you know, centrifuge, uh, and you know, you just pull that those uh, threads so that that samples just wheel around so fast. Yes, yes, yes. That was a something which I saw in YouTube, I guess. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. As uh, the paper fuse, yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We started out uh, that idea started out as a yo-yo. <laughs> you can also imagine using a yo-yo, and then we found we can get higher, um, you know, uh, centrifugal force by using the that configuration. It's also a little bit lower cost, okay. and so um, yeah, we we've used that successfully. I think um, we haven't brought that into the company yet, um, but we do hope to have a centrifuge at some point as well. Yeah. There is one more question. Uh, would we need an artificial source of light to view through the this pole scope to keep it horizontally, or is there a condenser which can concentrate the light? Yeah, yeah, I like the question. I mean, um, so you, I think, I think uh, when you say kept horizontally, in other words, if it's a liquid sample and you don't want to, uh, yeah, you don't yeah. want to tilt it up. You want to tilt it up. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you can tilt it up, then it's no issue, right? You can always yeah. look at the yeah. sky or whatever. Um, yes. If if you are going to be uh, trying to keep it horizontal, uh, you know, we've used different techniques for that. We don't, um, you know, we don't have a condenser lens that we've included. I have built them in the past, yeah. and uh, you know, a condenser lens, if built properly, can can be very helpful. <clears throat> but um, you can also just use, for example. Um, if you have another cell phone or if you're looking with your eye, yeah. um, you can use your cell phone as a light, or if you have two cell phones, then you can use one for viewing and one for illumination. Um, you know, we've also, um, uh, in the past used light boxes, um, or, you know, just, just any source that you have of light. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's a good point. If, if you are keeping it horizontal, you are going to need some way of, of providing illumination there. And it, um, you know, it, when, in our kits, we also have light modules um, that, that are included. And so you can uh, just turn the light module on and it clips onto the back magnetically. And so that can uh, provide lighting and it allows you to keep everything horizontal. So that's also a solution that we provide. But if you don't have the light module, then it, yeah, it requires some other creativity there. Jim, there is one question from our undergraduate student. What do you to this field? What makes you get up in the morning? What is more? What Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry, it was breaking just a little. What do you to this field? What makes you get up in the morning? What is what makes it? Oh, yeah. What makes me get up in the morning? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of answers to that question, but I think um, huh, just, just the opportunity to, um, you know, apply my creativity, I guess, first, I'm really an engineer. So the thing that, that really gets me excited is the, the idea that I could build something that people are like actually going to use and that can improve their lives. But also, um, you know, I've, I've, done quite a bit of travel um, in different parts of the world. And, you know, so I have experience outside the normal sphere of where I live and operate. And I, I kind of, um, yeah, I, I think I developed an, um, an appreciation for the fact that, um, you know, some, some innovation, even if it's kind of just a, I don't know, relatively simple tool or something you know, for me, that has is, is something that I enjoy using, but it doesn't like totally change my life, that for other people, it can be can have a very, very big impact. And so the the opportunity uh, just to try to make tools like that, that can have a big impact on people's lives. I think that's, that's something that really gets me excited. And yeah, like you say, get me gets me out of bed in the morning. Am I still on here? I don't know. You guys look frozen. Are you guys still there? I see some of you moving. Looks like some things, some people may have yeah, dropped. Yeah, you are audible, sir. Uh, oh, okay. Are you hearing my voice? Yeah. All right. So uh, there might be some technical issues. Uh, uh, I think they are. Uh, oh, okay. They are not in the session. So uh, okay. I will go through some some of the questions. Uh, okay. Great. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay, all of the questions I think uh, we have already answered. And uh, in just a minute. Uh, but while you're looking for questions there, I just want to take a moment to say uh, thank you guys. I've um, rarely had uh, such a big audience on a Zoom call like this. So this is, uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, 
to, to get a chance to speak to you all. And I hope, um, yeah, I hope that uh, you can have a good experience with Foldscope if, if you have those available. And, um, you know, if, if any of you um, do have, um, you know, a chance to use it and there's, you have any trouble or any feedback or questions for us, um, you know, please, uh, we, we always welcome your feedback and your thoughts. Um, so you can just contact us directly or you can always, you know, uh, post on the microcosmos any question or thought you have there. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you to, to you, to everyone here. <laughs> I think there is one more question. I think you have already answered that question. Uh, what can we, uh, what can be the, no, no. Yeah. How did you come up with this idea of a uh, scope? I think you have answered already it already, but uh, uh, if you want to yeah. repeat, you can. Yeah, yeah, no, I can say a few more words about that for sure. Um, so yeah, how did we come up with it? It actually was, um, you know, it took some time and, um, we had to really think outside the box. Uh, so where we started the problem was uh, to ask ourselves the question, how can we do microscopy at high magnification for you know, $1, $1 in parts? And uh, that's really where we started. And when you think, you know, when you think that's, um, when you push the problem to that, to that extent where you're really saying you only have $1 budget, it really makes you think differently, right? Because yeah, yeah. Um, wh what part of a conventional microscope is even $1? Not, you can't even get the little cover for the eyepiece probably for that price. And so, um, so yeah, we, we, um, when we started this problem, my advisor, uh, Dr. Manu Prakash was just starting his lab and we didn't have a lot of equipment there. So um, one thing we had was a printer with some paper in it. And so we had some paper, we were jotting some ideas. And what we realized is, well, you know, paper is one thing that would be inexpensive enough. And so we just started to think about that some more. And um, that's kind of how we started on the idea is just, you know, um, sort of being very frugal, um, taking, taking the, bringing the frugal part to the beginning so that there's, there's no, uh, we don't, we, we didn't get sidelined into a path that's where we ended up saying, ah, there's no way to reduce the cost. We started that with that at the beginning where the cost was the barrier. And then that was really uh, what allowed us to, to reach the solution that we did. Uh, one more question is there. Actually, the, uh, this question is from student uh, of uh, Bayas Science Center. Uh, what can be the most silent way of making full scope of our own? So it is a curious question of a student that what can be a most silent way of making full scope of uh, our own? And mm -hmm. so if he or she wants to make full scope, uh, whether it is possible or not, not up to the extent which you have made, but uh, at a primary level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I think it's it's actually very possible. The main um, challenge would be just to, you know, uh, find a lens that's going to work for that purpose. Um, so we um, we have a particular source for our uh, glass beads that where we get them. Uh, they have very good clarity, and I think um, maybe a lot of uh, vendors that would sell low cost glass beads, they would actually not have enough clarity uh, for that purpose. So. Um, that would be the, in my mind, the, the, uh, the first challenge that you would have to solve is, is finding a source for the glass bead and you could get that from us and then make your own using that uh, is uh, one solution. But once, once you have a glass bead, the, the other uh, key element that I think that we solved well that other um, you know, companies that have tried this uh, didn't solve as well is, is making a very good aperture. And so the, the hole, you know, essentially you have a, a ball and then you need to cover most of the ball. So it's just a very, very small hole. Um, I think it uh, tends to be on the order of about 30% of the diameter, 20 to 30% of the diameter um, is, is, is the size of the hole. Um, so you have to create a, something which is going to serve as the aperture for that lens. And then beyond that, um, you know, the, the design 
you can always look up in our PLOS One paper. If you just uh, use my name or Foldscope and uh, type PLOS One, you should be able to find our paper in a, in a search, uh, like a Google search. And uh, within the paper itself, within the PLOS One paper, you can find the details of our design and you can make a, you know, you can make your own design, but you need some way of mounting the slide and just a moving, you know, being able to move the lens around relative to the slide. Uh, but you, there's there's various, I think, um, solutions for that. So <laughs> hopefully that helps. I, I think the hardest part is finding the, the lens. Yeah. So I think uh, Pragyan uh, is, uh, means you have answered him very correctly. So uh, there are many, some more questions about whether we can buy uh, full scope and we, uh, whether we can buy it in India. I think, uh, yeah, we can, we are having full scope in India and yes. uh, we can buy, just go online and search for it and you will uh, get it. So yeah. uh, now I'm transferring uh, control to uh, Dr. Naik. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tiplesa. Uh, uh, it's a thank you, Dr. Jim. It was a wonderful discussion, and we really enjoyed uh, your overall uh, you know, uh, presentation as well as your, uh, uh, your thought process behind this entire full scope and how you are implementing this at the worldwide level. And I'm sure because in a, uh, this post pandemic time, there was a, so much of restriction uh, to all academic institutions. To how to teach, you know, the practical aspect of biology, how to show them things uh, with the help of microscope. Because if you look at the typical microscope, they are, you know, they, they are although portable, but they uh, every student cannot carry that microscope from the lab to his home or to his residence. And therefore, it was very difficult task to teach or observe the specimens, the biological specimen. Uh, so uh, now uh, I request Dr. Bagari sir to uh, uh, say a word of thanks. Okay, sir. So good morning to all. So friends, we have come to the concluding part of today's program, the story of old scope, the one dollar microscope. On behalf of Bajaj Science Center and the Bajaj College of Science, Varda, I would like to extend sincere gratitude and profound thanks to our distinguished speaker, Jim Sibulski, co-inventor and president Foldscope Instruments, California, for enlightening us about Foldscope and its various applications. Sir, the instrument microscope, which we use in our laboratory, it costs us somewhere around 15,000 Indian rupees. And that microscope has been fabricated for a very low cost of less than 100 rupees, which is a great addition to the concept of frugal science that aims at making low cost and highly effective instruments within the reach of common citizens. We all appreciate the massive contribution made by Jim Sibelski in enrichment of science to this low cost instruments. Sir, the simple and lucid manner of today's talk with very nice demonstrations, I hope it is well received by all the participants, which includes students and faculties from various stream of science. Sir, I am sure that your presentation on full scope it will trigger an academic excitement among the students and faculties, and it will be a source of inspiration to all of them 
to bring out the best in them i am looking forward to the day when our students will think and walk on the footsteps created by you and they will contribute to the enrichment of science our students at bajaj college of science have been given an opportunity to listen to this beautiful talk for which we feel privileged and have a sense of blessing for us once more i extend my sincere thanks to dr jim sibulski for his enlightening talk dr om mahodev principal of our college he has been a source of encouragement inspiration to all of us i take this opportunity to extend our thanks to him for his valuable guidance and providing the necessary facilities thanks are also due to bajaj science center and its director dr govind lakotia for collaborating with institutions innovation council of bajaj college of science vardha to provide an opportunity to our students to upgrade and educate themselves on the topic of full scope i also thank all the faculties who have been involved in the success of today's program thanks are also due to all the participants who are present here and whose attendance have made this program a grand success thank you to all and thank you to jim sibulski for such a nice presentation thank you sir in my pleasure okay. thanks dr magare dr naik for coming up for this program and jim thank you very much looking forward to meet you here at vardha so whenever you will visit next in india we would like to visit would like to have you here at our bajaj science center institute for the workshop please accept this thank you this. very much okay thank you thank you jim uh, now we will end this meeting over here uh, thank you sir thank thank you very much i it was it yeah, was a pleasure yeah. uh, to have the time here right. uh, yeah very very much enjoyed it thank you guys yes thank you right